Have you ever wondered how the world will go down in flames? Will it be due to zombies, extraterrestrial civilizations, or AI taking over? Nah, turns out it might actually be mosquitoes and scientists causing the chaos. It's funny how things created by nature aren't as threatening as the stuff that doesn't exist naturally. And you know what's on that list? Editing the DNA genome. Experiments with the genetic structure of living organisms can produce completely new species, and no one knows how nature will react to them. Let's look at an example of gene drive. So it all started with malaria mosquitoes. To somehow stop the growth of their population and prevent the spread of malaria, scientists created a gene that magically made mosquitoes only have male offspring. Several insects with this gene transmitted it to others during the mating season and thus spread infertility. Scientists were able to stop malaria and destroy almost the entire mosquito population. But imagine if something went wrong in the mosquito genome and their population began to increase exponentially. Malaria could spread across all continents and create huge problems for all of us. Now, let's move from the little mosquito problem to a planetary disaster that can be caused by the desire for knowledge, which is deeply embedded in our nature. British cosmologist Martin Rees once said that we lived in the first century when human beings could determine the planet's future. It seems that it's so easy not to destroy yourself, but our nature is quite complicated. In pursuit of solving the mysteries of the universe, we have built a giant machine that, according to some people, may destroy our planet. And this device is the Large Hadron Collider. The main task of this giant machine is to accelerate particles and make them collide with one another. Scientists expect that the collider will help better understand the structure of our universe. In simple words, this is a miniature simulator of the universe. Using it may also shed light on the mystery of dark matter. During operation, the machine compresses atoms and makes them crash into one another at great speed. Perhaps this is how our universe appeared. Some people fear that a small black hole may form because of this collision. A tiny particle with a huge weight will pull all objects inside itself. Its mass will grow, but its size won't change much. As a result, it will compress the entire Earth and turn it into a ball measuring a little more than 300 feet across. At the same time, our planet will still have the same weight. A powerful gravitational pull on such a small area of matter can form a black hole that might later swallow up our entire solar system. There are also theories that the Hadron Collider could open a portal to a parallel universe with creepy monsters that would enter our world. But of course, such theories have little to do with science. Scientists have already launched the collider several times, and as you can see, nothing terrible has happened. But there is a small nuance. With each launch, scientists increase the speed of particles. Who knows what will happen when they accelerate them too much? According to Martin Rees, the probability that Earth will become a black hole is very, very small. Particles with a much larger energy charge fly in space faster than in the Hadron Collider, and nothing catastrophic happens. Okay, now let's go back to our genomic games to see what else can happen if we continue experimenting with nature. The main problem might be an imbalance in ecosystems. In the 19th century, sailors accidentally brought mice to Gough Island in the South Atlantic Ocean. Rodents had no dangerous enemies there, so their population began to grow mice began to displace dozens of birds from their home. The rodents attacked the chicks and reduced the population of entire species. Trying to save the birds, scientists decided to get rid of the mice, but these little creatures still managed to survive. As a result, the balance of the whole ecosystem was disrupted. Using gene drive to get rid of one species can lead to uncontrolled population growth of another. Imagine that malaria mosquitoes controlled the population of some flies. And what would happen if these flies lost their main natural enemy? The population of these flies would start destroying other species, and it would begin a chain of destructive events. All this suggests that playing with things that don't exist in nature is very dangerous. We worry a lot about how artificial intelligence can take over the world and eliminate us. Still, at the same time, we don't pay attention to our actions. 
Genome editing can lead to positive consequences, such as the appearance of healthier people and destructive ones, like the creation of artificial bacteria that can cause serious health problems. In general, destroying other species is a trait inherent in humans. Because of our actions, many animals have disappeared from the face of the Earth. Moreover, we even destroy each other. Such aggressive behavior is our nature. And artificial intelligence doesn't have anthropomorphic properties. Its logic may be completely different from ours, and instead of destroying people, it might strive to save them. And we have something to save us from. Remember the giant asteroid that erased more than half of the living creatures on Earth? The fall of the space rock caused a massive blast wave, a tsunami, earthquakes, and dust clouds that covered the sun. Dinosaurs and other animals couldn't survive in such conditions. But what if something similar happens these days? Fortunately, we're better prepared than dinosaurs. Firstly, we have the technology to track giant meteorites and calculate their trajectory. And artificial intelligence can also help us with this. Secondly, we can destroy an asteroid before it reaches us. Several powerful rockets will quickly deal with any space rock and turn it into cosmic dust. Moreover, we will know in advance about its approach. But suppose that a huge stone the size of dozens of Everests will fly towards us. In that case, humanity should hurry with Mars colonization. But don't worry. Observing the sky shows that large asteroids capable of causing severe damage to our planet are moving in a different direction. The most giant known asteroid that could collide with Earth might do so in 2088. The probability that it will fall on our planet is 1 in 50,000, so you shouldn't have to worry about threats from outer space. What lies in the bowels of our planet is much more dangerous. Millions of tons of magma and hot gases can burst to the surface through destructive volcanic eruptions. More than 70,000 years ago, a large-scale eruption threw a tremendous amount of ash into the air, which then floated in the atmosphere in the form of a giant gray cloud for a long time. As a result, Earth's surface cooled down by several degrees, which led to one of the most massive extinctions in the history of our planet. Some eruptions happen not only inside volcanoes. There's such a thing as flood basalt. A colossal magma bubble accumulates under a vast area and begins to seep through faults in different parts. Magma slowly goes out there for many years and destroys all living things around. And the worst thing about this situation is that we can't do anything about it. Humanity has learned to track meteorites in space, but we're still not good at predicting a volcano's behavior. Even if we find out that some giant rock will wake up in the next six months, there's nothing we can do about that. We won't be able to prevent an eruption. All we can do is evacuate people from dangerous territory. We have no protection against earthquakes, and even more so, we can't stop the emission of ash into the atmosphere. It's possible that artificial intelligence will help us with this in the future, but right now, we are powerless. As you can see, there are several options for the end of the world for humanity, and they're all slightly different from those imposed by pop culture and the media. In the end, is it right to look for threats from space or artificial intelligence? Look at this spatula. Just a regular tool. Mix and spread ingredients, right? But wait, this one is floating in space for some reason. So there's this astronaut named Pierce Sellers. There he is. He's up there in space, just doing his thing. When all of a sudden, he accidentally drops his trusty spatula. Let me give you some context. This all happened during the Space Shuttle Discovery's STS-121 flight back in 2006. They were on their way to the ISS on a mission to test out some new safety techniques. And now this spatula is just a tiny drop in the ocean of space debris. Humans have been exploring space for, like, over half a century now. We've left all kinds of random stuff up there, from itty-bitty bolts to entire space stations. We've chucked a ton of things into the great beyond. Most of it burns up in a spectacular blaze as it re-enters Earth's atmosphere. But some bigger pieces can be a real danger for astronauts and their fancy spacecraft. Like, imagine accidentally crashing into a massive hunk of space junk. There are other weird things found in space. In November 2008, 
Astronaut Heidi Stefanischon Piper was out on a spacewalk trying to fix a jammed gear on a solar panel. Suddenly, she lost her grip on the bag. That bag weighed around 30 pounds and was filled with all sorts of cool stuff, like grease devices, a scraper tool, and bags for debris. And it was pretty pricey for a tool bag. It cost around $100,000. Sometime later, amateur astronomers spotted the bag floating around in space. If you're in North America, you can even check if the tool bag is passing through your little slice of the sky. Just hop on over to spaceweather.com's satellite tracker and see if you can catch a glimpse of this interstellar tool bag. By the way, if you need to twist some wires in space and you don't have pliers, well, you may stumble upon them as they're free-floating in space, too. Back in the day, when astronauts were just getting their space groove on, they tended to misplace things up there. During his first spacewalk on the Gemini 4 flight in 1965, Ed White, a famous spacewalker, accidentally let go of his glove. That glove decided to have its own adventure and hung out in orbit for a whole month before getting roasted in Earth's atmosphere. So not all debris is there to stay after all. So, space junk is basically all the stuff floating around in space that humans have left behind. Before we got all curious and started exploring, there wasn't any space debris hanging around. Imagine space junk as a little kid who just learned how to walk and play with their own toys. When they couldn't walk yet, it was easy for the person watching them to keep the play area clean. They were in charge of taking out the toys and putting them away. But now that the kids can walk, they can grab as many toys as they want and make a huge mess on the carpet. Well, it's kind of the same with us humans exploring outer space. We've sent all sorts of cool gadgets, like cameras, rovers, and rockets to check out what's out there. But we haven't really thought about bringing them back to Earth. And that's where the problem comes in. All this space junk floating around could mess up outer space and even our planet. When we think about outer space, we often imagine vast open spaces that are yet to be fully explored. Humans have only discovered a tiny 5% of the universe. But here's something they might not always consider. The impact of all the cool gadgets they send out there. Believe it or not, as of May 2022, we've got more than 5,000 satellites orbiting Earth. Over 5,000 opportunities for these machines to go haywire, get lost in space, or even worse, create a bunch of debris that could harm both outer space and our lovely planet. There's at least 3,000 satellites just hanging around up there, not doing anything useful, and nobody seems to be bothered about bringing them back home. And what if one of these inactive satellites accidentally collides with one of the thousands of other space junk pieces orbiting our planet? It will result in a catastrophic disaster. We're talking about a crazy release of toxic substances that could wreak havoc on our poor Earth. Space junk can mess things up for scientists trying to make important discoveries. It's not just floating around aimlessly in space or posing a threat to Earth it can hinder their chances of success. Even the moon has its fair share of junk, which Neil Armstrong definitely didn't encounter when he landed there in 1969. Think of it like this. Imagine you're an artist trying to create a huge painting. It's hard to do that if there's a bunch of old paints, brushes, and other stuff cluttering up your play area, right? Well, it's the same deal for scientists trying to set up camp and use new technologies for advanced missions and space exploration. They need a clean and organized space, just like you need a tidy work area. Otherwise, it's chaos. So here's the deal with space junk. It's not just about sending stuff up into the atmosphere. It's also about how far away we send it. You see, when satellites are sent over 22,000 miles into the atmosphere, it becomes a real problem to retrieve them and bring them back to Earth. And that leads to even more space junk floating around up there. Now, I know what you're thinking. How long will it take for space junk to become a major problem? Well, it might still be a few more years before it messes things up in outer space. But hey. That doesn't mean it's not a threat to satellites we have up there right now. 
Those poor guys are at risk of getting damaged, destroyed, or even leaking toxic stuff because of all that junk. So, space debris isn't just a problem for space exploration, but it's also a problem for us Earthlings, even though it's floating thousands of miles above us. Space junk is like that annoying neighbor who throws trash out their window and it ends up in your backyard. Except, instead of trash, it's releasing all sorts of chemicals into our atmosphere that are slowly destroying our precious ozone layer. It can even ruin future space missions. Imagine this, you're all pumped up to launch a rocket into space, but nope, space junk decides to crash the party. Not only does it mess up the launch, but it also adds more pollution to our already struggling atmosphere. And if things couldn't get worse, imagine a shooting star or meteor accidentally smacking into some space junk on its way to Earth. Boom! Millions of toxic particles raining down on us, further depleting the ozone layer. Plus, space debris is becoming a real problem for space missions. In 2022, we found some space debris hanging out on Mars. The Perseverance rover stumbled upon its own backshell just chilling on the surface of Jezero Crater. They also spotted a random piece of a thermal blanket that might have come from the rover's descent stage. Also, human-made space debris actually smacked into the moon in 2022. It was probably some old rocket body from the 2014 Chang'e 5T1 mission, but nobody saw that coming. It left a double crater behind. The more space junk we have floating around in low Earth orbit, the higher the chances of a cosmic collision. These collisions are no joke. They've already caused some serious satellite damage. Even the ISS has to constantly maneuver to dodge space debris. But scientists seem to know how to clean up this orbital mess. They're planning to send space vehicles armed with nets, harpoons, and even robotic arms to capture and deorbit all that junk. Let me take you to a place that seems to be out of this world. Life inside this cave has been isolated from the outside world for about 5.5 million years. And it does show. See for yourself. Due to such a long isolation, the conditions inside the Mobile Cave are like nowhere else on our planet. A unique ecosystem is flourishing there, even though there is a severe lack of sunlight inside the cave, and the air is toxic. The cave, located a few miles west of the Black Sea in Romania, was first discovered in 1986. Nowadays, you can only visit it if you have special permission. Plus, the central caverns are guarded naturally by narrow limestone tunnels and vertical shafts. So, if you're no stranger to claustrophobia, you'd probably better not enter this place. In the depth of the cave, the air has twice less oxygen than the air outside. Instead, it contains a lot of carbon dioxide and hydrogen sulfide, so not the freshest air you can breathe. It's also pitch black inside the cavern. But despite, or should I say, thanks to, this cocktail of extremely harsh conditions, the site is a true goldmine for biologists. Shockingly, life seems to be booming here. In a 1996 study, scientists identified 48 species, and 33 of them were unique to the cave. Most of the creatures inhabiting the cave are tiny, with long limbs and antennae that help them navigate in the dark. They have no vision and lack pigment, and it makes sense. Why would you need to be able to see if you live in total darkness? And why would you need to be pretty and colorful with no one to see you? Now, I'm going to take you to another cave. It's no less amazing, but looks very different. This is the Giant Crystal Cave, aka the Cave of the Crystals, in Mexico. These ginormous crystals were found in 2000 by a mining company after the water was pumped out of the cave. Two miners then saw the crystals after entering the drying cave on foot. These awe-inspiring crystals are actually massive gypsum pillars hidden 984 feet underground. They're anchored to the walls and the floor of the scorching hot cave. Scientists estimate that the crystals could have been already growing for half a million years. That's why many of them are so long and wide that you can walk across them. Unfortunately, visiting this wonder of nature is impossible at the moment. But maybe it's for the better since the giant crystal cave is a dangerous place that can easily turn into a trap. 
For tens of thousands of years, it was filled with groundwater, which was originally pushed upward into the opening by a magma chamber located in the depths of our planet. The magma under the cave kept the water hot, but eventually the temperature of the water dipped below 136 degrees Fahrenheit. As a result, the water started to fill with calcium and sulfate, whose particles began to recombine into gypsum. And then, white-tinted crystals took over the cave. And since they stayed underwater, they were able to keep growing. You don't have to fly to space to take a closer look at a black hole. Scientists have found something very similar to black holes in the southern Atlantic Ocean. A black hole has such an enormous gravitational pull that once something gets pulled inside, it doesn't have any chance to escape. Even light can't get out of a black hole. But ocean black holes seem to be almost as powerful as their space relatives. But instead of catching the light, they do the same with water. Ocean eddies are massive whirlpools that spin against the main current. They usually swirl billions of tons of water, and most of them are larger than a city. These whirlpools are so powerful that nothing trapped by them can escape. But the scariest thing is that you might not even notice heading into one of them. These things are so huge that you won't spot their boundaries until it's too late. When scientists started exploring ocean vortices with the help of satellites, they discovered the borders of several eddies. After that, they managed to prove that, mathematically, these whirlpools are the same as mysterious black holes in space. Massive eddies are surrounded by super tight barriers where fluid moves in closed loops. Even water can't get out from the inside of these loops. That's why tight ocean vortices play the role of enormous containers. Water inside them can be totally different from the ocean surrounding an eddy. And I'm not only talking about its temperature. The salt content inside and outside a whirlpool often differs as well. On the thin Curonian spit splitting the Baltic Sea from the Curonian Lagoon, there is one of the most bizarre places on Earth. Locals call this area the Dancing Forest because pine trees in this forest have shockingly unusual shapes. They twist in spirals and circles along the ground. There are some theories why it could be happening, of course. Some people claim that huge amounts of positive and negative energies once clashed in that spot. More down-to-earth individuals believe that the reason is geological. Sandy soil in the area is too unstable to hold trees growing upright. The most popular is the idea that strong winds blowing from the water influence the shape of the trees. In any case, experts haven't come to the final conclusion yet. Look at these underwater crop circles. For the first time, they were spotted in 1995, close to southern Japan's coast. Local divers called these seven feet wide structures mystery circles. The enigma had been plaguing many mines for almost 16 years until the culprit was finally caught. Imagine the researcher's surprise when it turned out to be a male pufferfish. The fish needs a bit more than a week to build one circle, and the aesthetics are obviously crucial. A male is swimming inside the circle, digging valleys in the sand with its fins. But that's not all. The fish also use shells and corals to decorate particular parts of their circles. This whole build a circle thing has a practical purpose as well. The way a male fish swims pushes the sand toward the center of the circle and creates a mound which later serves as a nest. The next mystery on our list is in the Caribbean. Just off the coast of Belize, there's a giant sinkhole. That's the Great Blue Hole. It's about 1,000 feet across and more than 400 feet deep. Once, a long, long time ago, this hole was a cave. But then rising waters filled it, making it collapse in on itself. The deeper you'll descend into the Great Hole's crystalline waters, the darker it will become. You'll see tons of stalactite-filled caves there, but entering them is extremely dangerous unless you want to get hopelessly lost. Once you reach a depth of 50 feet, you'll notice that the water is shimmering. That's the invisible line dividing the sinkhole's salty top from the freshwater abyss. You might want to turn back right now. Who knows what you might come across in the murky depths. There was an old Amazonian legend that told about the river that was so hot that it boiled. And it was believed to be just a legend until Peruvian geoscientist Andres Ruzo questioned if the river could be real. All experts denied such a possibility. After all, hot rivers do exist, but only in the areas where there are volcanoes. As for the part of the country mentioned in the legend, there are no volcanoes in that region. But Andres Russo was too dedicated to give up. 
and in 2011, he finally located the river from the legends. The water in it was indeed steaming hot. Its temperature was 186 degrees Fahrenheit, not boiling, but pretty close to this point. But what shocked the researcher the most was the size of the river. One could think that the almost boiling water was the result of the activity of an underwater hot spring. But thermal pools are always small, while the river is 20 feet deep and flows for almost four miles. This is the only river of its kind on our planet. You step on the surface of the moon. It's unusual. You definitely feel lighter here, and it's easier to walk. You decide to check out that obsessive idea of yours. Jump on Earth's natural satellite. And even despite your bulky spacesuit, you literally fly up into the air. Woohoo! Anyway, you continue your walk on the surface of the moon when you feel something strange. The ground under your feet is… is it shaking? It feels as if an earthquake has just started on the moon. But that's simply impossible. Or is it? Surprisingly, your gut feeling hasn't let you down this time. Moonquakes do exist. In fact, there are four types of moonquakes that are strong enough to be detected from a large distance. There are deep moonquakes occurring more than 430 miles below the surface. Then there are meteoroid impacts. Thermoquakes occur when the frigid lunar crust expands. It happens when the morning sun illuminates the satellite after a two-week-long deep freeze lunar night. And there are also shallow moonquakes. They're the only ones that are similar to earthquakes on our planet. Shallow moonquakes happen 12 to 19 miles below the surface, and they're the most powerful and dangerous. Between 1972 and 1977, the Apollo Seismic Network recorded 28 such moonquakes, and some of them measured more than 5 on the Richter scale. On Earth, such an earthquake is strong enough to crack plaster and move heavy furniture. Plus, shallow moonquakes are very long-lasting in compared to earthquakes. Once they get going, they can continue for up to 10 minutes. As for the average earthquake, it typically continues for 10 to 30 seconds. Scientists are still not sure what causes shallow moonquakes, and even where exactly they occur. One of the theories is that moonquakes happen at the rims of large, relatively young craters that probably slump from time to time. Interestingly, the Moon and Earth aren't the only places where earthquakes occur. No, scientists have recorded quakes, tremors, vibrations, and shakes in other regions of our solar system, too. Let's take Mercury, for example. A few years ago, scientists discovered that this planet was shrinking, and that's why it seems to be so tectonically active. Or Venus. This world is a tectonic puzzle for experts. At the moment, Venus has no tectonic plates, and it might have never had them. But its surface has folds and faults and looks as if it could have tectonic plates. On the other hand, these features might have appeared because of other processes, for example, volcanic activity. But even though we haven't observed any Venus quakes, scientists believe they could detect them since their vibration seems to ripple through the thick atmosphere of the planet. Now, Mars. We know for sure that this planet is seismically active. NASA's lander placed a seismometer on the surface of the red planet. And in 2019, it managed to measure its first Mars quake. After that, the lander continued to record quakes. But they were so weak that if they happened on our planet, they'd be completely covered by the background noise of Earth's oceans. But a space body doesn't have to be a full-fledged planet to have active tectonics. Let's take Pluto. This dwarf planet is geologically active at the moment. In 2014, NASA's New Horizons spacecraft was flying through the Pluto system when it recorded complex geological features on this dwarf planet. Scientists concluded that Pluto might have quakes, or should I call them Pluto quakes, when its liquid water ocean freezes and thaws beneath the dwarf planet's icy crust. Jupiter's moons Europa and Io, as well as Saturn's moons Titan and Enceladus, are also geologically active despite their small size. Their features range from volcanoes and water plumes to potential subsurface oceans. Now, I bet you don't know these cool facts about earthquakes that occur on our planet. There's one place on Earth where a whopping 90% of all earthquakes occur. It's called the Ring of Fire, and it stretches around the Pacific Ocean from New Zealand all the way to South America. Hmm, looks to me more like a horseshoe. Anyway. Experts claim that these countless earthquakes are caused by the abundance of volcanoes in that region and the constant movement of the tectonic plates. 
Around half a million earthquakes happen on Earth every year. But many of them occur very, very deep in the Earth's crust. And only special equipment can detect them. We feel around 20% of earthquakes. And only 100 of them can cause damage. The largest recorded earthquake occurred in Chile in May 1960. It was a magnitude 9.5 on the Richter scale. It was truly devastating. During that earthquake, seismographs detected and recorded seismic waves that traveled all over the world. They shook the planet for many days. As for the most powerful earthquake that occurred in the U.S., it was 9.2 and happened in Alaska. By the way, Alaska, along with California, is the most earthquake-prone state in the U.S. and one of the most seismically active regions in the world. A magnitude 7 earthquake occurs there almost every year. A mega-earthquake can actually shorten the length of a day for the entire planet. NASA claims that really large earthquakes can shift our planet's axis and, thus, change the duration of a day. Now, of course, you won't notice it since this change is measured in microseconds, and one microsecond is one millionth of a second. Scientists think that the 9.1 Sumatra earthquake, which occurred in 2004, shortened the day by 6.8 microseconds. Now, not even the best specialist can predict an earthquake. That's mostly because the mechanisms that trigger earthquakes are extremely deep underground. But these days, people have learned how to figure out a more precise time frame of when an earthquake might occur. Earthquakes can be triggered by volcanic eruptions or, let's say, meteor impacts. But most of them are caused by the movements of our planet's tectonic plates. Earth's surface consists of 15 to 20 constantly moving tectonic plates. Pressure increases when they shift, and this can make the crust of our planet break. San Francisco is moving toward Los Angeles right at this moment. The speed of its movement is about 2 inches per year. That's as fast as your fingernails grow. It's happening because the two sides of the San Andreas Fault, which is the continental fault extending 750 miles through California, are slipping past each other. So, in several million years, Los Angeles and San Francisco will be neighbors. Lakes, ponds, and canals become slightly warmer and start to stink before an earthquake. It happens because gases get released when tectonic plates shift. Most animals feel these signs and change their behavior. For example, scientists noted toads completely disappearing before an earthquake in Italy in 2009. But as soon as the natural disaster was over, they returned. Even after an earthquake is over, you might still see water sloshing around in your swimming pool. There's no need to worry. This is a phenomenon called a seiche. The water can keep sloshing around for hours after the earthquake is over. For example, the pool at the University of Arizona lost some water from a seiche caused by an earthquake in Mexico that occurred 1,200 miles away. On February 27, 2010, a massive earthquake started in Chile. It measured 8.8 on the Richter scale. As a result, Earth's crust in that region was ripped so dramatically that a city called Concepcion moved 10 feet to the west. Another earthquake resulted in the tallest mountain in the world, Everest, shrinking by one inch. It happened in 2015 when a magnitude 7.5 earthquake caused several Himalayan mountains to decrease in size. The Japanese used to believe that earthquakes were caused by Namazu, a giant catfish that lived submerged in the mud under the Japanese islands. The fish would thrash about, causing seismic activity. As for the ancient Greeks, they were sure that a powerful sea deity, Poseidon, produced earthquakes by hitting his trident against the earth when he was angry. According to Hindu mythology, Eight elephants hold Earth in place. They are, in turn, balanced on the back of a ginormous turtle, standing on the coils of an even larger snake. And every time any of these animals moves, an earthquake occurs. It happened in Iceland on Friday, March 19, 2021, at 8.45 p.m., about 20 miles southwest of the capital. Molten rock suddenly burst through the surface from below. Bright lava fountains then lit up the night sky. A volcano in this valley finally woke up after almost 800 years of sleeping soundly. We divide volcanoes into three categories. Active, dormant, or extinct. 
around 1,900 of them around the globe are considered active. That means they've erupted in the recent past and will likely do it again in the possible near future. Dormant volcanoes haven't popped off for a long time, but they still may in the future. You could say they're sort of sleeping. As for extinct ones, those guys haven't done anything in more than a million years. The eruption in Iceland wasn't super explosive, and this all happened 6 miles from the nearest town. So everyone was perfectly safe. Many even came to see it up close, while other brave visitors tried to fry eggs and bacon on the lava. Just be careful not to burn your breakfast black. Lava can be over 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. It burns everything in its path. Yet it also produces some of the most fertile land for agriculture. This eruption gave a relatively small amount of lava at first. But it's been spreading across the valley in different directions, forming a sort of shield that's constantly growing. You can never really predict how fast a lava flow will be until you see it. It all depends on how thick it is and how steep the mountain slope. Lava can ooze slowly at about 20 feet a minute, a fraction of the average person's walking speed. Or it can flow as fast as 30 miles per hour, which even the fastest person on Earth can't outrun. But the lava isn't even the most dangerous thing about volcanoes. That would be the toxic gases spewing from the eruption. And those spread faster and further than the lava flow. Luckily, in Iceland's case, the wind has been blowing these gases away from residential areas. Scientists weren't surprised this volcano erupted. They knew it was coming. Increasingly stronger earthquakes had been shaking this area for the past 15 months. There were 50,000 earthquakes within just the three weeks leading up to the eruption. That's 100 per hour. The volcano has been active since March, and geologists say this could last for weeks, months, years, or even decades of constant eruptions in the area. Mount Shasta is in the top 5 most dangerous volcanoes in the US, so geologists are keeping a close eye on it. The last eruption was in 1250. I wasn't around then, but this volcano erupts every 600 to 800 years. Which means, tick-tock, we're due any day now. About an hour from Portland, Oregon, there's an active volcano that last erupted in the 19th century. Next time it goes off, scientists think it'll produce larger amounts of ash and dust. This could cause an electrical blackout and make water unsafe to drink in the area. But the experts pay close attention to Mount Hood. They'll be able to give plenty of warning so people can react in time. Kilauea is one of the most active volcanoes in the world. It's been erupting almost constantly since 1983, making it also one of the longest eruptions known on Earth. It's the youngest land volcano in Hawaii. Volcanoes can take thousands of years to form, but others can pop up practically overnight. A volcano in Mexico just erupted in an open field in 1943 and started growing from there. Within a year, it was almost 1,500 feet tall. When the eruptions finally stopped nine years later, the mount had reached a height of over 9,200 feet. Mount Fuji is an iconic symbol of Japan. The last time it erupted was in 1707, and it sent a shower of burning rocks as far as 60 miles away. If a similar eruption happened today, Tokyo would be within that vicinity. Mount Fuji is right on the Ring of Fire, that horseshoe-shaped region in the Pacific Ocean full of active volcanoes and earthquakes. From one end to the other, it's almost 25,000 miles long. It could wrap all the way around the Earth's equator. In January 2020, a tall volcano in the Philippines started spewing lava, sending huge plumes of ash half a mile up into the sky. The eruption even triggered a rare phenomenon a dirty thunderstorm. That's when the smoke cloud above a volcano produces its own lightning. The chance of volcanic tsunamis was also high. Those are usually caused by tectonic movements that occur because of volcanic activity. Tall has erupted more than 30 times in the last 450 years. This volcano in Ecuador last erupted in 2016. 
scientists think it might be showing some early warning signs of magma on the move. This is an active stratovolcano, a specific cone-shaped type with steep sides. They form from sticky lava that doesn't flow that easily. That lava goes around the vent, cooling and piling on itself to form these steep walls. These types are more likely to produce explosive eruptions like the ones we see in movies. Ruapehu is the oldest national park in New Zealand, a volcanic wonderland where you can closely see all those steaming craters, magnificent lakes, and unusual rock formations. It last erupted in 2007 and has had 10 eruptions since the mid-19th century. But eruptions, lava flows, and toxic gases aren't the only danger coming from volcanoes. There's also a thing called lahar, a kind of volcanic mud flow of debris. In between eruptions, snow melts and a lake forms in the caldera. If the last eruption brought mud, ash, and rocks in the lake, it becomes dangerously full. In that case, only a temporary dam holds it back. Indonesia has the biggest number of active volcanoes in the world, including one called Anak Krakatoa. It means child of Krakatoa, and its famous parent isn't far away. A huge tsunami in 2018 partially woke Junior, a scary thought since Senior had one of the most powerful eruptions ever seen on this planet in 1883. Krakatoa's boom was the loudest sound ever heard. People over 2,000 miles away could hear the explosion. The sound wave circled the globe seven times. And scientists say it's hard to predict this volcano's eruption patterns. Mount Yasur in Vanuatu is one of just a few volcanoes in the world where you can see a lava lake. Tourists even go there to peer over the edge and get a look at the burning, bubbling lake below. Well, except for when the volcanic activity goes to levels 3 and 4 out of 5, that means there are more intense earthquakes, volcanic tremors, or steam, gas, or ash ejections. Then this place is off-limits because… duh. This volcano in the DR Congo has the most active and largest lake volcano in the world. And all that lava is unusually fluid meaning it travels faster and further than the stuff coming out of most volcanoes. It's certainly not amongst the tallest ones, but Ethiopia's Erta Ali is unique in that it has a lava lake almost constantly, which is pretty rare. The locals call it a smoking mountain because its lava lake often causes eruptions. This volcano is near the Danakil Depression, one of the hottest places on our planet. Marupi has been erupting on a regular basis since the mid-16th century. This volcano helps scientists do crucial research on how eruptions work and how they can warn people in time. After it was dormant for a while, this volcano in central Mexico sprang back to life in 1994. Ever since then, it's been producing huge mud flows and strong explosions in unpredictable intervals. In the past, enormous eruptions coming from this giant buried entire cities in pyramids. Imagine staying in a hotel and waking up to the magnificent view of a massive volcano covered in glowing rivers of lava and clouds of ash. When it lets off heat, visitors to this area in Guatemala take a chance to roast some marshmallows there. One of the most active volcanoes on Earth is on a small island north of Sicily. Stromboli has regular explosions, together with glowing lava coming from vents inside the crater. Not too far away is Etna, Europe's most active volcano and one of the biggest continental ones in the world. By the way, Earth definitely isn't the only planet with volcanoes. The largest one in our solar system is on Mars. It would cover the entire state of Arizona, and it rises nearly three times higher than Mount Everest. Ooh, don't look down.